اشهد الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin by praising Allah We praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify and bear witness that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. After that, the best speech is the book of Allah and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad and the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion. And every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is termed as a bid'ah or an innovation. And all of the innovations are misguidance. All of the misguidance is going astray. And all the going astray is in the fire. Here it is. Coca-Cola. What is this drink, Coca-Cola? Let's read it. What does it say? Prepared and bottled by Coca-Cola. Amtil has given us the address. That's nice. And it tells us the contents of this fantastic drink. The dynamic ribbon device and the contoured bottle contains carbonated water. Carbonated water means fizzy water, water with gas in it. Gas. Sugar, color, 150. Food acid, flavorings, and of course, the modern replacement for the original ingredient, which was cocaine, is now caffeine. I think it's very interesting because, of course, today's talk is not about Coca-Cola itself, but it is about what Coca-Cola symbolizes and what Coca-Cola stands for. Of course, Coca-Cola symbolizes and stands for the American culture. The American culture. If there is one symbol we could say that identifies American culture, it is Coca-Cola. And really, it's incredibly appropriate that this drink symbolizes that culture. Because the Coca-Cola culture is a culture of materialism, it's a culture of consumerism, it's a culture that tells us that in order to enjoy life and in order to get the best out of life you should feed your passions and your desires and your appetites. That the way to be successful and the way to be happy is by surrounding yourself with the material possessions of the world. 
buy this, buy that, have this, have that. What you feel like, do it. What you feel like eating, eat it. The way you feel like behaving, behave like that. The things you feel like doing in life, do it. The God that is worshipped, the thing that is submit, the, the thing that the human being is to submit to and surrender to and obey, are the passions and the desires, the nafs, what we call the nafs, al hawa, the passions, the self, the desire. And this Coca-Cola symbolizes that pretty well. It symbolizes not only this attitude and this mentality and this philosophy of life, it also gives us a pretty good idea of what is the real effect of living your life in that way. Because what does Coca-Cola do for you? You drink it, it gives you a immediate, almost immediate response. The immediate response is a feeling of satisfaction, gratification, and a boost of energy. This is what Coca-Cola does. You drink it, satisfaction, you get a, a boost of sugar from the, and a boost from the caffeine, and probably a burp soon afterwards from the gas. But the reality is that very soon you follow a downward spiral. You follow a down, downward spiral. And soon after, as you felt high, you soon feel a low. And in order to try and reach that high again, then you're going to take some more of this drink or some similar drink in order to reboost yourself. So in order to try and maintain yourself on this constant high, then you're drinking more and more and taking more and more. And this is the reality of the person and the people who worship their desires and worship their passions and worship themselves. In fact, it is illustrative of the whole manner in which Western society exists. Exactly that. There is no long-lasting satisfaction. Satisfaction is temporary, it is a temporary boost, a temporary moment of joy, it is followed by an equally low moment, and in order to try and bring back that moment of happiness, we consume more. We find more avenues in order to satisfy our desires, but the reality is, the passion and the desire can never be satisfied. This is a statement of fact about the human being. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, that if, if the son of Adam was given a valley of gold, he would desire another one. If the son of Adam was given a valley of gold, he would desire another one. Nothing will satisfy the desires of the sons and the daughters of Adam, except the dust of the grave. Nothing is going to satisfy our desires. The only time that our desires will end is when we are dead. So you see, a civilization, if we can call it a civilization, or a philosophy or an ideology that teaches us that the way to be happy in life is by satisfying your passions and your desires, by following your cravings, physical and emotional and ideological, that success in life is by surrounding yourself with material possessions. The reality is, we know that this brings no long-lasting satisfaction. We buy something nice, we buy some new clothes, we get a new house, we get a new car. But how long does the joy and the pleasure of that last? A few hours, a few days, maybe a few years. 
But before long we are cra- craving for something more expensive, more beautiful, more fast, faster. If our, we get our kicks from adrenaline, then we try this sport and that sport, but always we are looking for something that is going to give us more of an adrenaline kick. Similarly, some people satisfy their passions and their desires through sexual encounters, promiscuity, but there is no satisfaction. Because once you have tried everything, then you need something else to excite you. You need something else to stimulate you. So people go further and further down the road. Fetishes, orgies, same-sex relationships. Or, it's not enough anymore that you have your own wife. You have to go and you have to enjoy yourself with another man's wife. That's how you have to get your kicks. Because this is the reality. You're never satisfied. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you want more. It doesn't matter how much fame and success you have, you want more. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are, you want to be more beautiful. This is the reality. So when we look at Western society, what do we find? We find something pretty horrifying. We find a whole culture completely obsessed with consumerism. And what is the result and what is the consequence of that? What is the result and the consequence? The consequence is that we have a very minute portion of the world's population consuming a huge portion of its resources. 17%. 17% of the world's population consumes 70% of its resources. One seven. 17% of the world's population consumes 70% of the world's resources. We know that the rainforests are being destroyed. We know that our environment is being polluted. We know that there is starvation. That people are dying. People do not have basic sanitation. People do not have basic access to clean water, to food, to basic medical care. But where is this taking place? These things are taking place in the so-called third world. But if you look to the so-called third world, you will find something very strange. You'll find these people are actually exporting food. They are export, although the people are dying, they are exporting food. Although they don't have sufficient medicines, they are exporting the ingredients to make the medicines. They don't have sufficient Resources to clothe themselves, the people do not even have clothes, yet they are making clothes for other people. Where is this food being exported to? Where are these ingredients and these resources and these minerals being exported to? Where are these clothes, these fashions, where are they being exported to? Who is consuming all of these things? The West, America, Australia, Europe. That small percentage of the world's population. Controlling, consuming and exploiting the resources of the world. Why? Because of a way of life, the Coca-Cola culture that teaches you That the way to enjoy your life is by following your passions and your desires and satisfying your base animalistic instincts. This is the reality. And in order for this society, this culture, 
to continue to exist, it is necessary that large portions of the world's population lives in poverty and is subjugated politically, economically and ideologically. Because the Western capitalist materialistic system depends on being able to exploit people. It depends on being able to acquire food and minerals and resources and labor at the most minimal cost and to be able to repackage it and resell it at the maximum cost. This is the reality of the Coca-Cola culture. This is the reality of the materialistic philosophy that is now dominating the world in which we live. And the reality is that the Western world will stop ultimately at nothing. Wars, instigating wars, inventing wars, murdering people, bombing them, killing them, it is all not really important in order to achieve the ultimate goal of dominating the world economically and politically and militarily. Why? As they say, to guard our precious way of life. That's what they say. That's what George Bush told us. To guard our precious way of life. Their precious way of life means that we are free to follow our passions and our desires, that the way to be happy is to have as many material goods as you can, and it doesn't really matter if the rest of the world suffers as long as we have our precious way of life. That's the reality. So what has this got to do with the Muslims? Why therefore do we choose this title the Coca-Cola Muslim generation. What is taking place here, of course, is a war, a conflict. Not a conflict, mind you, necessarily, of arms and weapons, but it is an ideological conflict. It is a war of ideologies. It is a war of world views. It is a war, a battle concerning what is the nature of the human being? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? And what is the reason for our existence? And what is the means for the human being to achieve true success and true happiness? This is the war, this is the conflict that is taking place. So what we find is another world view, another ideology, another concept, and that is Islam. Islam teaches something quite different. Islam teaches that the way to success and happiness is not by acquiring material possessions. It is not through seeking to satisfy your passions and your desires and your lusts and following your whims and your inclinations. Rather, the needs of the human being are quite different to that. Islam teaches that those who follow this path who worship this God, because it is a type of God, it's a type of deity, when you worship your passions and your desires, it is a type of religion in reality, it's a type of worship, it's a type of deity. That this is a false God, it is a false deity. Islam teaches that this is not the way through which human beings can achieve the real success. Because that is not the nature of the human being. Rather, Islam teaches 
that there is a creator, one God, who has brought this universe and everything into uh, and everything in it, he has brought it into existence for a reason and for a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason. And this begs the question. This begs the question. What is our purpose? What is the reason for our existence? Why are we here? What is the purpose of the existence of the human being? We have now discussed already something about the idea of the Coca-Cola culture. The materialistic viewpoint. But what does Islam say? What does the Quran say? The Quran teaches us that God has created us for a noble purpose. The Quran says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَى لِيَعْبُدُونَ This means that God is telling us in the Quran that He has created us to worship Him. Some people say, is that it? I mean the purpose of my existence is just to worship God. And that's because they have a very narrow concept of what worship means. They think of worship in the secular materialistic term that has been defined by the Western society. Worship means maybe, you know, you go to the mosque five times a day or you go to the church once a week, you perform some rituals, you perform some acts, that is considered to be worship. However, the term ibadah in Islam, which we translate as worship, has a very, very deep, rich meaning. It is something much more than some mere formal actions that you perform. Worship in Islam is a total way of living. It is something that is supposed to occupy the human being throughout all of their life. From the moment they wake up to when they go to sleep and in fact even whilst they are sleeping. Worship is supposed to occupy all of your life. And how does it do that? How does worship occupy all of your life? If we, t- if we look to the definition of the term ibadah, and this is what God has created us for ibadah, what does it actually mean? The, the word ibadah can be, we can explain it as meaning, everything which God loves and is pleased with. Everything which God loves, everything which God is pleased with, is ibadah. Everything which God loves, and everything which God is pleased with, is worship ibadah. Or we don't want to use the word worship, we'll just say ibadah. Whether it is from the actions of the heart, or the actions of the limbs. What are the actions of the heart? People think, what is the action of the heart? Actions of the heart are things like love, hope, fear, reverential awe, trust, reliance, intention, sincerity. These are all examples of actions of the heart. So you have to try to make every action of the heart an action that God loves and is pleased with. And the actions of the limbs are things like, well, everything that you perform with your limbs. It could be prayer, it could be fasting, it could be the relationship between a husband and his wife. It could be how you walk, how you talk. All of these things are actions of the limbs. So you try to make every action that you do an action that God loves and that God is pleased with. And it is in doing this That the human being, and only in doing this, that the human being finds real peace, tranquility, happiness and satisfaction. Only in this. 
Everything else is like the Coca-Cola. You drink it, it'll give you a quick buzz. It'll make you feel good for a short time. But that is not going to last long. In fact, just as it made you feel good, soon it will make you feel bad. And in reality, it will never ever satisfy you. It gives you the illusion, temporarily, of happiness. Anyone who has been addicted to drinking alcohol, or has been addicted to smoking marijuana or taking drugs, they will experience this on a more severe level. This is something that anyone who's been down that path knows. When you drink alcohol, or when you smoke marijuana, or whatever other thing it is, you get a moment. It may be, in the case of heroin, for example, it may last 24 hours. In the case of smoking marijuana, it may last, it depends, you know, a few hours. You have a moment, you have that time, where you feel a sense of peace, you feel a sense of happiness. But the problem is, is it wears out. And the other problem is that in order to get back that feeling, you have to take more and more and more. In fact, it gets to a stage that it doesn't even affect you anymore. But you are now addicted. You are addicted to the habit and you continue. Even when you know that this is no longer bringing you any benefit at all, but you are upon this path of almost self-destruction. You have reached, you have become an addict. And the fact that it doesn't seem to do anything for you, in fact now, even the feeling of happiness is gone, but you are down that path and it is almost impossible sometimes to leave it. This is the reality. So it may seem that people who do not worship God, who do not follow that path of righteousness, who do not try to do everything that is pleasing to Allah, it may seem that they are happy. It may seem that they experience moments of happiness. And you may see those moments of happiness. And you may think, oh, these are happy people. These people have a good life. They have a good quality of life. But this is only the temporary outward appearance. In fact, if you observe the situation for long enough, and you observe it deeply enough, and you observe it critically enough, you will see that that is not the case. You will see that they do not stay happy for very long. An example of this that came to light recently in England was that the Minister for Health made an announcement that many young women were beginning to drink excessively. This is a problem in England. Many young women were beginning to drink excessively, especially what they call binge drinking. And they were worried because, and one of the immediate effects that they could notice is that this was causing a great deal of liver damage. It was causing a a great deal of liver damage. And interestingly enough, I came across an article in a newspaper written by two young professional girls, well off, good jobs, and they confessed that they were binge drinkers. But the interesting thing was, why? Why were they binge drinking? What caused them to binge drink? They said that our life is so empty and boring. Our life is so empty and boring. And we feel a state of depression. And the only thing that seems to bring a moment of release is unabated hedonism. Meaning just indulging in our passions and our desires and doing whatever we feel like. And then for a moment we get a relief. That's what she said. That's what they were writing. How is it that people who have good jobs, nice income, beautiful flat house, things, 
They have all the food they want to eat. They are clothed with what they want to clothe themselves with. How do these people feel therefore empty and depressed? What is, them, what is there for them to feel empty and depressed about? So if you look at this, and this is one case, and you'll find many cases like that, you'll find the same story again and again and again. One has to wonder why. Why do so many rock stars go on this path of self-destruction? Drugs, drink, committing suicide, killing themselves in many different ways. If fame, beauty, money is supposed to be the means to achieve happiness, then these should be the most happy of all people. But that's not the fact. That's not the way it is. There's something wrong. So that's what I'm saying. When you look at the issue deeply, you'll find that although these people appear on the outward surface to be happy, to be enjoying themselves, the reality is something quite different. That this way of living produces no real sense of satisfaction or happiness at all. It is very temporary. Sometimes some people can string enough moments and acquire enough things to make it appear as if they have happiness in their life. But that is not the reality of their situation. Islam teaches that the way to be happy is completely different. It is, as we have already mentioned, through making your actions, actions that are beloved and pleasing to God. This produces within the soul of the human being, within the depths of the human being, a deep sense of well-being and happiness and contentment. And the person who has acquired this could be subjected to the most horrific types of physical and mental deprivation. They could live in extremely poor conditions. They could be deprived of what we might think are basic necessities. Yet you would find these people experience a state of bliss and happiness. In fact, some of the some of those Muslims and some of those people who have embarked upon the spiritual path, if we want to call it, have put themselves in a situation where they are deprived of many of the so-called physical necessities because they consider them to be, in some respect, an impediment a barrier between them reaching that state of true bliss and true happiness that comes from being a complete and true worshipper of God. Now the thing is this. This way of life, Islam, on an ideological level, therefore is a competitor a threat, a danger to the materialistic consumer philosophy, the Coca-Cola culture. Why? Because in reality, there is something very sick about this culture. And the sick thing is that it actually depends and relies upon you being miserable for its existence. The Coca-Cola culture actually needs people to be unhappy. Because unhappy people consume. Unhappy people need to fill their miserable lives with fashion, music, the fantasy of Hollywood, drugs, alcohol, sports. They, the miserable people, need to fill their miserable lives with all these trinkets, 
And these things give them these moments of happiness. So miserable people consume. That's the reality. It is not people who are deeply content and feel a deep sense of well-being and happiness internally. No, these people are not good consumers. These people don't care whether they have this or they don't have that. If they have it, they're happy. If they don't have it, they're happy. It's the same to them. This is actually the state that the Muslim should be. If we have material possessions, we thank Allah and we are happy. If we don't have it, we still thank Allah and we're still happy. So how do you persuade people like that to consume? These are not the people who will be buying your products, buying your magazines, listening to your music, going and seeing your movies. They're not good consumers. Therefore the reality is that these people ideologically and in fact even economically they are a threat. Because their whole culture and society relies upon people being miserable, depressed and discontented. So a way of life that is going to give them peace and tranquility and happiness and you don't have to drink a bottle of Coca-Cola or go and watch Steven Seagal kill a thousand Muslims to make you happy, right? Okay? Or you don't have to listen to some music or go to some rave and dance all night to make yourself feel good. You don't have to go and buy some Gucci, Armani, you know, Pierre Cardin, uh, Chanel number no. 5, whatever, right? Because, you know, it doesn't bother you. These people are not good consumers. In fact, that is a direct ideological threat. It is a direct ideological threat. So what we have to realize here is that there is an ideological battle. Many of us, they have, we haven't, as Muslims and non-Muslims as well, normal people, we haven't realized that. This is something, however, I am absolutely sure. The intellectual elite of the Western world have realized that. And certainly, the multinational corporations they realize that. They see that threat. And this is why Islam really poses a threat. It doesn't pose a threat to the normal people living in the world. Not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. It is the means to human beings achieving true peace, true tranquility and true happiness. But it is a threat to the vested interests of a few people. Not only that, but because Islam is not a religion that is based or is not a way of life or an ideology that is based in the material, then even on a political and military level, Islam becomes very difficult to deal with. What do you do with the people who don't really care whether they live or die? In fact, they'll be happy to die if dying is something that is pleasing to God and then they're happy to do it. What do you do with the people like that? What do you do with the people who you can't really bribe them because wealth is not their concern? You can't threaten them with economic sanctions and so on and so forth, because wealth is not their concern, then you can see therefore that even though these people may not have the latest military hardware, they may not have the latest equipment, but they are therefore militarily and politically also a great threat. And this ideology also, This mentality is a very liberating one. It is a very liberating one. It is something that gives people the courage and the conviction to stand up against Western political and economic and ideological domination. It gives people the courage to stand up for themselves. Not to worry so much about the consequences. Because what is important to these individuals is not the pleasure of their desires and their passions, but the pleasure of their Lord.
Now, I want to go back in history a little bit. And I suppose this part of the lecture, I have to say, is maybe a little bit more orientated towards the Muslims. If we go back in history a bit, we'll find something very interesting. We'll find many things actually very interesting that took place. In fact, it's a sad thing that Muslims do not study history and do not learn the lessons of history. But the particular thing that I want to focus today is on the spread of Christianity. Christianity started as a small, we could say, sect. Inshallah, as we Muslims believe anyway, it is the true sect. A small sect in Judea, or what is now Israel or Palestine, but at the time it was Judea, occupied at that time by the Roman Empire. There was a man... A prophet, as we believe, he is a prophet and a man, he is not God or the son of God. His name is Jesus or Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. Who was the Messiah to the Jews? The Messiah meaning the anointed one. He came to call them back to the true, pure religion of God. That they should worship God alone and submit to his commandments. Today we have a religion called Christianity. Which, according to many Western scholars, and certainly this is affirmed by the Qur'an, does not resemble in any way, shape or form what Jesus or Isa ibn Maryam taught. It is a completely different religion. It doesn't teach that we should worship God and submit to His commandments. Rather, it teaches that we should worship Jesus, that we should believe He is God, and that salvation comes by believing that He died on the cross for our sins. You know, it's not my proposal today or my intention today to go into a long theological and historical discussion about that. But anyone who has the time and takes the interest we'll find something very remarkable. You will know that in the year 345, a pagan Roman emperor called Constantine held a council in a city called Nicaea, which is in present day Turkey. It's the famous council of Nicaea, which took place at about 345 years after the time of Jesus. In this council convened by a pagan Roman emperor, the bishops or some selected bishops of Christianity were forced and compelled to come to a decision about what is the creed and what is the belief and what is the scripture upon which the whole of the Christians should unite upon. Why would a pagan Roman emperor living 1,400 years, uh, living in that time, nearly 2,000 years ago, why would he do that, a pagan Roman emperor? Why? Because Christianity was a very, very, very powerful force in the Roman Empire at the time. Constantine realized that as long as the Christians were disunited and arguing and bickering with one another, then the strength and the power of his empire was going to be sacked. So his idea was now to unite the Christians upon a single doctrine. What happened to come out of that council was for the first time Christians were actually forced to believe a particular doctrine. This became known as the Athanasius Creed and that is what we know today as the concept of the Trinity that Jesus is God and that he is of one essence with God and from this council also the so-called four canonical Gospels were chosen. But what actually happened? Rome became the center of Christianity. In fact, it became known as the Holy Roman Empire. But what really took place, and this is the interesting thing, is it really that Christianity 
took over the Roman Empire? Or is it that the Roman Empire Romanized Christianity? In other words, was it Christianity that took over? Or was it really the Roman Empire that took over Christianity? If we look at it, you will find it is that the Roman Empire had more of an influence on Christianity than the original teachings of Jesus had on the Roman Empire. In fact, I remember when I was being brought up a Catholic and I was studying Roman and Greek mythology, I remember thinking as I was studying it, this is amazingly similar to what I believe is a Catholic. The Romans had a trinity of gods. Saturnalius, Sol Inviticus and Mithra. Mithra was the son of God and he was God and he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and he was born on the 25th of December. It was believed that by Mithra and by being a devotee of Mithra that your sins would be forgiven. And this is the way to achieve salvation. The Romans also had a pantheon of gods which they worshipped and they called upon for different needs. So, if you needed something, you would call upon this God. If you needed something, you would call upon that God. Just as the Catholics, if you lose something, you pray to St. Anthony. When you're going travelling, you pray to St. Christopher. If you're going to do some art, you pray to St. Luke, the, the patron saint of arts. Just as the Romans had their different gods for different things, I said, this is very similar. What my religion teaches me, Catholicism, is so similar to that. And it's only later, when I began to study the issue, I realized that in fact, what had happened was, that Christianity had become paganized. That in fact, there was no difference. The theology is exactly the same. The basic fundamental teachings, if you boil them down to what they are saying, the paganism of the Romans and the Christianity of the Christians was very, very similar. Hardly different at all. And that leads me now to the Coca-Cola Muslim generation. Because we have heard people say, MashaAllah. It's difficult to translate. I won't bother trying to translate MashaAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah, you see, even though what happened on the 11th of September was very bad, but you see, many people now have become Muslim. It's true. There has been an incredible number of conversions, and I've seen this myself in England, and I've heard it reported from America that many people have come to Islam after the 11th of September. Why? Because it, it led them to research into Islam, to read the Qur'an, to look about what Islam is teaching, and then they realized, this is not what these people are saying it is. This religion is not a religion of terror and war. People realize that this is the truth. This is from God. So they embraced Islam. But when I stood back and I analyzed and I looked at what is going on, and I looked at the statements of many Muslim, Muslim leaders and Muslim scholars, and I looked also at the position and the attitudes of many Muslim leaders and many Muslim countries, then a thought came to me. Are we actually seeing the people of the West coming to Islam? Or are we actually observing the westernization of Islam? Is it that the people are becoming Muslim? Or is it that Islam is becoming westernized? Is it really that we have growing up amongst us Muslims upon Islam? Or is it, as we call it, the Coca-Cola Muslim generation. In other words, they say they are Muslim, they outwardly profess Islam, they say they believe in the Qur'an, they pray maybe even five times a day, they fast the month of Ramadan, they give the zakah, but, and this is the but, 
When you start to examine their attitudes, their beliefs, their motivations, you will find what has taken place is a mixture. They have taken some of this and they have taken some of that. Are they really now motivated by seeking the pleasure of Allah that to make every action an action that Allah loves and is pleased with? Or are they now trying to make a compromise? Trying to find a compromise. How can we say we're Muslim and then still be consumers? How can, can we still now run after the things of this world? And this, I believe, brothers and sisters, is exactly the disease that is taking place amongst the Muslims now. And it is a disease that the ideological competitors are very, very happy to propagate it and to spread it. And that is why they have now divided us into two groups. You have the moderate Muslim and the fundamentalist Muslim. You see, we don't have a problem with the moderate Muslims. They're okay because the moderate Muslims are the Coca-Cola Muslims. The Coca-Cola Muslims. They say we're Muslim, we pray, but you'll find what? We're happy to accept the concepts of democracy. We're happy to accept the concepts of the unity of the religions. We're happy to say that polygamy is an outdated thing and it's not for these days. We're happy to follow all these ideas and the, I, we're now going to liberate women. And we're now going to, according to what they say, is liberation of women. That's another topic anyway. We're happy to take interest and take mortgages and get insurance and enjoy music and movies and, you know... Coca-Cola Muslims. And the others are the fundamentalists. What do you mean the fundamentalists? If you really look at it and you examine it, these so-called fundamentalists, and there's no doubt, there are people who are extremists amongst them. There are people who go beyond the bounds of what Islam allows. There are people who commit acts in the name of Islam, and it is not from Islam, I am not trying to justify any of that. So you have to understand what I'm saying here. But this group that is termed the fundamentalists, what is the real objection? If you go down and you look and you examine, what is really taking place? What is the problem with these fundamentalists? What do they say? They say, Islam is the whole way of life. We have to be real Muslims. We have to establish Islam in our family life, our personal life, our family life, our political life, our economic life. Being a Muslim is not only about praying five times a day, but it is about accepting everything in the Qur'an. That we have to try and make everything we do, and everything we think, and everything we say, something that Allah loves and is pleased with. And, and that includes the laws and the rules by which we live. Criminal law, family law, international law, all of these things are covered in Islam. The Qur'an teaches all of these things. Because Islam is a whole way of life. Now these are the ones that are considered now to be dangerous. The fundamentalists. These are the ones that they realized are the real ideological competitors. The so-called fundamentalist Islam. Because the reality is, the Coca-Cola Muslims are the ones they have really, it's not so much that they have brought Islam to the West, that Islam has, that the West has westernized them. And now you find a new westernized version of Islam coming out. And this is something you find very widespread. Even people who might say, I'm a fundamentalist Muslim, you'll find often they are very deeply affected by the ideas of the Western society. In fact, I dare say, to be completely honest, if you ask me, I'm probably, I have a bit of Coca-Cola Muslim in me as well. No, I'm serious. I'd be honest about myself. I actually thought, when I'm giving this talk, is it fair? Many of the things I might criticize people for, maybe I have some faults myself. 
Maybe there are some things I enjoy. In fact, I'll be quite frank, there are many things I enjoy about the Western life. And maybe that's not entirely good. Not that those things you can't enjoy them. In Islam, Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful religion. It's a balanced religion. You can enjoy the beautiful things of life. You can enjoy the beautiful things. You can enjoy the goods and the things of this world. You're permitted to do that. You can have a nice car. You can drink Coca-Cola. It's not actually haram, forbidden to drink Coca-Cola. You can wear Nike shoes. You can do it. You can wear Wrangler jeans if you want to. It's not forbidden. It's not forbidden. But the point is this, and it goes back to what I mentioned. Is that this is not what we believe is the source of our happiness in life. In other words, if I have it, that's fine. If I don't have it, that's also fine. If I have the nice car, well, alhamdulillah, I thank Allah and I praise Him. If I don't have it, I still thank Allah and I praise Him and I am content. But the reality is, brothers and sisters, with most of the Muslims today, that is not our condition. That is not our condition. If we don't have that nice car, we're not happy. If we don't have our house, that we own it, we're not happy. If we don't have that good income coming in, we're not happy. If we don't have those nice clothes, we're not happy. And this is a real sign that we have been overtaken ideologically. And this is the condition, brothers and sisters, in which we find ourselves. And this is something actually that the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, he prophesied, he warned about it, he mentioned. He said that the thing that he feared most for his nation, for this ummah, was that Allah would open up the doors of material possessions, open up the doors of goodness, meaning the material things, and that because of it, we would vie with one another, compete with one another, not for the pleasure of Allah, but in order to acquire those things. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad said, and he prophesied, something that we find taking place today. He said, soon the nations will gather together to take from you in the same way that you invite people to come and share in a feast. So the companion said, O Messenger of God, is that because we are small in number? Is that because we're few? Because they imagined that the only way the enemies could come and take our lands and take our possessions and take our things is because we're too few to defend ourselves. This is how the companions imagined. We must be so few and our numbers must be sm so small we couldn't defend ourselves. But the Prophet Sassim said, no. He said, you will be many like the foam on the sea. Like this foam, you'll be so many. But you'll be like the rubbish that is carried down by the flood. Meaning your numbers will be many, but you will be rubbish. You'll be really of low quality. And then he said, and Allah will take the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies. Meaning your enemies won't be afraid of you anymore. And into your hearts... He will cast wahan. And they said, O Messenger of Allah, what is wahan? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hubbu dunya wa karyat al mawt Love of the world, love of life, and fear of death. Meaning, as we can see, that as today we are 1.6 billion Muslims on the face of the earth. It is now the largest religion in the world. One in every five people on the earth's surface is now a Muslim. Like the foam on the sea. Yet what do we find? What do we find? We find that our enemies have made our lands a feast for themselves. They help ourselves to our oil to our resources. They control us politically, they control us economically. In fact, probably, we could even say, 
they are now very beginning to control us ideologically as well. Why? Why? Because in reality we have become like them. We have given in and we have begun to follow their way of life. We now begin to love the life and we look forward to the life and we enjoy the life and we now begin to think that this life is the be all and the end all and this is where the pleasure lies and this is where the happiness lies. This is the condition exactly in which we find ourselves. Whereas the reality is of course that this world is a very temporary abode. Our stay upon this planet, our stay in this life is very, very short. And the life to come in reality is the one that is enduring and that is long. So, I wrote down a few things that I thought was symptomatic. Some of the things that we can see. Some of the qualities that we have that are a hallmark of what we could call the Coca-Cola Muslim. One of the things I thought I wanted to do, right? Which I'm not going to do it. I was going to shake this bottle of Coke up, really. <laughs> yes. And then I was going to open it. And I think you all know what happens when you shake up a bottle of Coke and you open it, right? You know what happens? It goes everywhere. All the Coke spills out and you have about this much left. And it's all over your clothes and it's very sticky and it's pretty horrible. And then all you have is a little bit of flat, really pretty revolting liquid left at the bottom. That's the first problem. When Muslims are like that, someone comes along, he gives a nice talk, he gives a lecture, he gives a soul-stirring, inspirational, you know, lecture, and everyone gets all excited, and they get all excited, and they get all excited, and psh, like that. And then, three days later, three months later, or whatever, what's left? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing of any benefit. Nothing that even tastes nice. And that's how we've become. Just like the people in the West. That's how they get. You know, they get all emotional. Live Aid, Band Aid, you know. Help the this, help the that. Get them all emotional. Sing some songs, this and that. Ooh, like that. You know, whatever. Three weeks later, they've forgotten it. What's the next thing? What's the next piece of news? What's the next thing? They forgot. Nothing permanent. You know, we get all emotional, we've got, to, we've got to change the environment, we've got to do something, we've got to, you know, we've got, we've got to make the world green again, and, and we get excited for a few days, and we put a few cans in the recycling bin, and that's it, man, we give up. Yeah, that's how it is. So they always now have to bring new adverts, and new campaigns, and new things, and it's just like that coke, you shake it, shake it, shake it, shh, but what's left? The Muslims have become just like that, emotional. We react to everything emotionally. We react to everything emotionally. And unfortunately, sometimes that emotional reaction is extremely violent. But this is not the way of Islam. This is not the way of Islam. The Muslim is not supposed to be emotional. The Muslim is supposed to be guided by the book of Allah. By the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Emotion does not really come into it. We are only seeking what is pleasing to Allah. Maybe we have to be subjected to many trials and many tests and many tribulations. But if we are supposed to be patient and that's what Allah wants, we will be patient. If we are supposed to resist, then we resist. But it's according to what Allah teaches and the way that Allah teaches it. But that's not how we are brothers and sisters. We are people who become emotional people. And that's the fact, I'm sure all of you know, when they, put, when they put Bosnia in the news, oh, we all raised that money for Bosnia and we drove, I don't know, in Europe, people drove trucks and convoys in Bosnia. They're still having lots of problems in Bosnia, but no one cares anymore. Because now, then it was Kosovo, and then Kosovo was in the news, so we all react to that, and then it was Chechnya, and so we reacted to that, and then it was, and then, and that's how, whatever they put in front of us, we react. This is emotion. This is not the way a Muslim is supposed to be. And this is to do with our great lack of knowledge and our deep insight. We have really become so ignorant even about our religion. That's one of the first problems. And I must, I'm just picking some things here. Another thing, I'm sure you all relate to this, is marriage. 
our idea of marriage. What do we think marriage is? I put a little quiz at the back. I'm going to mention it quickly, right? Are you a Coca-Cola Muslim? So we'll mention that at the end. Are you a Coca-Cola Muslim? In fact, let's, 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 go through the, let's go through the question there. So you can all like, see now whether you're a Coca-Cola Muslim, right? Number one, question number one, right? To see if you're a Coca-Cola Muslim, right? Number one question. Does your Iman, your Iman means, uh, again that would be another lecture, I'm not going to say what. The Muslims know anyway what Iman is, we loosely translate it as faith. Does your Iman go very high and very low and very high and very low? That's the first question. Does your Iman go up and down and up and down a lot like that? Is that what you find? Does your faith go up and down? If it is yes, that's one point for being a Coca-Cola Muslim. All right? Number two. Number two. This is not in order of priority, by the way. Do you think a man should only have one wife? Not in order of priority. If you think a man should have only one wife, put a tick for being a Coca-Cola Muslim. Do you think of marriage as a match held together by love or a working relationship trying to build a better Muslim nation? If you think that marriage is a lovey-dovey, you know, Hollywood, Bollywood affair, then put a big tick for you being a Hollywood, uh, uh, a Hollywood Muslim, a Coca-Cola Muslim. <laughs> Number three. Number three, are you planning to have two or three kids at the most and give them the best? Or are you hoping for a football team? <laughs> if you are hoping to have, if you are planning to have one or two kids and give them the best, you are definitely in the Coca-Cola Muslim League. Absolutely. That is a big sign of being a Coca-Cola Muslim. Conquered by the West ideologically. When you hear a speaker... When you, speak, when you hear a speaker, a lecturer, and you like what he says, do you want to get his autograph? <laughs> if it is yes, Coca-Cola Muslim. Another point for being a Coca-Cola Muslim. Do you prefer to get your knowledge from audio tapes and videos? Or do you think that, and do you try to sit with a scholar and memorize and study? If the only way you get your knowledge is by videos and tapes, then definitely another point for Coca-Cola Muslim. Are you a member of Blockbuster, Movie Land, <laughs> or any other video store? If, if you are a tick, you're, that's another point for being a Coca-Cola Muslim. Do you wait for the latest J-Lo, M&M <laughs> or whatever other music CD? Or do you wait for the Islamic, latest Islamic books? Or both? Or both? If you wait for the latest J-Lo, M&M and music CDs, forget it, you're not even in the Muslim league right now, inshallah, you're still a Muslim, but anyway, you are still a Muslim, but... That's not good. That, you have to get two points for being a Coca-Cola Muslim there. If, if the latest Islamic books, then okay, no problem. If it's both, definitely one point for being a Coca-Cola Muslim, because that's the Coca-Cola Muslim. They take a bit of this and they take a bit of that. So if it's both, then you give, give yourself a tick. Do you spend more time reading Vogue Hot 4, did you say? <laughs> that's the... Fast Car Magazine, they told me. Clio, Dolly, or any other hobby or thing that interests you. So do you spend more time reading that, or do you spend, or, or watching, uh, I, I can't say footy, I'm supposed, I have to say footy, yeah? That's right, footy. <laughs> We'd say in English, footy. <laughs> so what do you spend more time doing? Do you spend more time reading those magazines and pursuing your hobbies and watching footy? Or do you spend more time reading the Qur'an and studying books of Islamic knowledge? If you spend more time with the hobbies, more time, I'm not saying hobbies are haram, but if you spend more time, then you have to put a tick, Coca-Cola Muslim. And the other one is, would you prefer to take a mortgage or be content with rent? 
If you want to take a mortgage, definitely brothers and sisters, you have to give yourself 5, 10, 15 ticks for being a Coca-Cola Muslim. So anyway, inshallah, that was my brief uh, guide to whether you are a Coca-Cola Muslim or not, inshallah. I hope all of us uh, didn't score too many points in that regard. Um, I won't tell you what my score was. <coughs> But inshallah we hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides all of us to what is best for us. Although we left it on a light hearted note, of course brothers and sisters, the talk has a very serious uh, note to it and a very serious tone to it. So brothers and sisters, this is something, although we made it light hearted at the end, please, something that we should really think about and we should really reflect about. Because at the end of the day, this is about our akhirah. It's not only about our akhirah, about whether our destination is the place of joy or the place of torment, the place of bliss or the place of misery, but it is also about the real condition of our hearts and our souls in this life. Will we be from those people who are really happy, really content, really peaceful, or are we just going to be those people who experience some fleeting moments of joy, but in reality our life is just a downward spiral of misery where we consume more and more and self-destruct ourselves and self-destruct our societies and self-destruct our world. And we seek refuge with Allah from that. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa jazakallah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.